The Greek world, dating back to the Minoan Age, was connected east and west through trade, and has more or less stayed that way ever since. And if we look later, at the Archaic period, we see the Greeks evolve their wanderlust from trade to settlement, again, both east and west. This is now the third video in my mini-series on the origins of Magna Graecia, the name given to southern Italy and Sicily by the ancient Romans to designate the overwhelming Hellenic culture flowing through the heel of the Italian peninsula. Sometime between 770 and 750 BCE, Greeks from the island of Euboea, citizens of the leading city-states of Chalcis and Eritrea, landed on the shores of a small island opposite Naples called Pithecusae, in an experiment that would light the fuse of Mediterranean Hellenic expansion. This little settlement was a great success, and just a few years later, more Chalcidians went to the Oracle at Delphi to establish a legitimate colony on the Italian mainland, which they called Cumae. They soon realised their military power far outstripped the local people, the Oscans, and after turning them out of the best spots, prospered from the region's fertility. This led to more Chalcidian settling Sicily this time, in 734 BCE, closer to Greece, and doing the same thing. They expelled the local people, the Sikels, from their land, and established first the colony of Naxos, then Zankli. These colonies expanded further, with or without support from the Hellenic motherland, establishing the Chalcidian colonies of Catane, Leontini, and Region, across the Sicilian east coast, and the southern tip of the mainland. Now it's time for us to leave Chalcis and Duboia behind, focusing instead on those who followed in their wake. You see, of course other Greeks once they did on the action, and seeing the success of Pithecusae, Cumae, and Naxos, other Greeks did. We touched on the Corinthian settlement at Syracuse in the last video, and more Greeks were to follow. So let's pick up there. Right, so we're now looking at Corinth, and unlike the state-led expeditions of Chalcis and Eritrea, the Corinthian founding of Syracuse is a bit more shrouded in what I can only call a mythological tragic romance. Corinth was ruled in the 8th century by the Bacchidae dynasty. Under their rule, it flourished, but others of the aristocracy instead claimed lineage from Heracles as Heraclidae. One very controversial, yet very powerful noble of this house was Archias. He fell in love with a man named Actaeon, but the love was not returned in kind, and one day Archias gathered his cronies and the Epechormasen, he riotously rushed the man's house to take him away by force, and in the fray, Actaeon was tragically slain. His father called on Poseidon to curse Corinth, so Archias and a delegate of others were sent to the oracle at Delphi to fix the problem. The oracle said unto Archias, now, whether the myth of Archias and Actaeon is to be believed, or whether it was because Archias was a Heraclid noble dissatisfied with the Bacchiad rule, he never returned to Corinth, instead sailing to the place described by the Pythian. And so, in 733 BCE, he came to said island, very close to the Sicilian shore we now call Syracuse. Sicelius exelassas proton ectes nesu, en heienun he polis e entorsestin. He first drove out the Sicels from the island on which the inner city now stands. This island, still known in Italian today as Isola di Ortigia, later expanded across the water to become a much larger polis. It would eventually become one of the most powerful Greek presences in the Mediterranean, if not the most powerful. Next up though, we have the Megarans, who at this time were a client state of Corinth, but with a degree enough of autonomy to name their colonies after themselves. 
Under the orders of Corinth, but the leadership of a Megaran named Lamis, an expedition was sent out to Sicily in 730 BCE shortly after the foundation of Leontini by the Chalcidians. They headed in their wake to settle at a place called Trotilos, but lacking the facilities to build a successful colony there immediately, soon joined the Chalcidians at Leontini. This is an interesting insight into the collaboration and interactions between the different Greeks, still in the early stages of this Italian colonization. All was well and good for a few months, but the Chalcidians in Leontini didn't like sharing, and instead of abandoning the settlement they'd built, as they had at Pithecusae with the Eritreans, instead expelled the poor Megarans. Lamis led them south, where they tried again at Thapsos, but he died before it could be completed. And so, just a year later, in 729 BCE, the Megarans went to more friendly territory close to Corinthian Syracuse, where they did, finally, establish the successful colony of Megara Hyblaia. The secret to the success, according to Thucydides, was simple. The local Sikel king Hyblon just up and left his land for them. Again, this is a fascinating insight. Cumae, Naxos, Syracuse, Leontini, these were all founded through arms and battle. And whether Oscan or Sikel, the indigenous Italic peoples learnt swiftly, for this instance, that cultural assimilation with the invading Hellenes was far preferable to domination. The next phase now of colonization was driven by the Achaeans. The Chalcidian and Corinthian colonies by and large now were focused more internally, looking to consolidate their economic, cultural and agricultural prosperity by scythe or by spear. The Achaeans sent out their first colonists in a joint venture with Troizen sometime around 720 to 710 BCE. Instead of Sicily, or going right round the heel of Italy onto the west side of the peninsula, they instead sailed straight over the Ionian Sea to the underside of the boot. The colony they set up here would be called Sibaris. It was a perfect location, a coastal spot close to rivers to promote trade with yet more fertile land to benefit from. Their landing was heralded this time by the indigenous people as not as a threat, but as an opportunity. The Italics, when they heard of the Greeks setting up a colony there, actually began to gravitate towards the site, looking to profit from its presence. Diodorus Siculus gives us this concise yet very insightful passage to consider of the first Achaean settlement in Italy. En tois en prosten chronois selenon ctisanton cata ten Italian polin suvarin, sune vet aften la vin tachian afxesin, dia ten areten tes choras. Back when the Greeks founded Sybaris in Italy, the city ended up growing rapidly because of the land's great value. Jimenez ya ranameson lu in potamon, tu te cratios, kai tu suvarios, a fut aftes et tu getes proseiorias, hoi catoi quistentes, ne momenoi polen, kai carpaforon horan, me galus ectesanto plutus. Since it stood between two rivers, the Crathis and the Sybaris, where it got its name from, the settlers, working large and fertile fields, ended up very wealthy indeed. Polois de metadidontes des politias epitosuto proevesan, hoste doxai pullu proehin ton cata ten italian oicuntun. Pullu anthropia tetusuto dianencan, hoste ten polenehin politon, triaconta muriadas. And they granted new citizenship to many, and the common opinion was that they were a leader among the colonies of Italy, and grew such a population that the city boasted 300,000 inhabitants. Now, Sybaris might have suffered from its own success, as it ended up being destroyed about three times before being relocated and renamed many years later, and became such a den of debauchery, so they say, that we even have a word in English, Sybarite, to denote excessive hedonism derived directly from this settlement. Their following colonies were Croton and Caulonia. Croton's founding was spearheaded by Miskelos, who was said to have gone against the Delphic Oracle's wishes for his proposed settlement and instead headed near Sibaris, possibly hearing of its burgeoning success. Croton became famous for its athletes, I discussed its most famous, the legendary Milo of Croton, a wrestler, in my video on the Gymnasia of Ancient Greece. 
Now, although the two began as Achaean colonies, they ended up very bitter rivals in the region, which will be the theme of my last video in this mini-series on Magna Graecia, looking at the legacy of these prominent colonies and their shift from Apoikiai to Poles in their own right. Kaolonia was a few years later led by an Oikistes called Typhon of Aegium, not the demonical enemy of Zeus. Just tying things up now, we are at the end of the 8th century BCE going into the 7th, which for the most part was less about Greeks coming from Greece to set up colonies, but rather more about existing settlements in Italy extending their own power to establish colonies of their own. We do however see some other city-states get their strongholds in Italy first though, including modern Taranto founded by Sparta, Sidis by the Colophons, Gela by the Rhodians and Cretans, and Locri by the Locrians. But anyway, as I've said, the next video will be the last about Magna Graecia, but I've had so much fun researching for this subject, so a big thank you to my Patreon contributors for suggesting the idea. When it's out, we'll have a look at how some of the bigger and more significant colonies left their mark on Italy with some stories to tell of their most notable exploits. And if you'd like to support some more, know what's happening next on the channel, to see clips of work in progress, classically themed posts, suggest ideas, offer details, speak to me directly, then my Patreon page is linked in the description. But if you're watching the video, like what you see, then I'm absolutely happy enough, and I really hope that you enjoy the next one.